All right, well, thanks so much. Uh, the, it's nice when you, you see Deepak's editorials because you kind of know what he's going to say. Um, and I was laughing that he had to have that topic because I thought initially I was going to be assigned the opposite topic. And then I realized that in an interventional meeting, I get to defend PCI, which is a pretty good place to start off from. Um, you know, I think that the reason that it's important to have this discussion, though, is because I'm sure that everyone was all aware of the various headlines that came out after this orbital trial came out um, just about six months ago. Placebo effect of the heart, unbelievable heart stents fail to ease chest pain, heart stents don't actually help treat chest pain, and thousands of heart patients may get stents that actually do may more harm than good. And so as a result, I think it's important to assess the data and try to figure out what we're trying to do for patients with stable ischemic heart disease, both with respect to symptoms as well as quality of life. So just to start off with, there's abundant data, admittedly non-blinded data, that show that there's clear reduction in angina for patients that have stable ischemic heart disease treated with PCI. That's why you see the cases being done today throughout this meeting, many other meetings worldwide, and that's why many patients get treated. There are patients who don't have angina that get treated, and we may talk a little bit about that, but it's pretty incontrovertible that this exists in the realm of unblinded trials. So along comes the Orbita trial, which was a sham controlled study, 200 30 patients, ultimately 200 randomized, at five United Kingdom sites over three and a half years. And I won't go through the study in detail other than to say that these are folks that had been waiting with angina for approximately nine months with symptoms who were then treated with medical therapy and randomized in the trial. The primary endpoint of the study is important because it was negative. And the reality is, is even when reanalyzed, adjusting for the differences in baseline characteristics, it was still negative, but there are some important points that are worth mentioning. The first is that the exercise time did go up significantly, very significantly, in the patients treated with PCI. And it really did not change among patients who are randomized to sham. So for those out there who says this is all a sham effect that we're seeing, there's actually not a whole lot of sham effect that's seen within the trial itself. Second, I think one can glean that had this trial enrolled more patients, maybe half as many more patients, double as many patients, it would most certainly have been called positive as well. And the reality is, is positive and negative is a statistical question. The real question for our patients is how much are they actually going to improve? Other aspects, and Deepak mentioned these, are what are the characteristics of the population? Because in the articles that came out, this was generalized to any patient undergoing PCI, even those that may have been acute. First, these were single vessel disease patients with angiographically legitimate lesions, but 30% of them were physiologically non-obstructive. Uh, non Second, there was intense medical therapy prior to randomization, and patient symptoms were very well controlled. When you ask the patients, how many symptoms are you having, the reality is that most patients had symptoms that were occurring at once a week at best and maybe even less than that, once a month in many cases. Also, when you look at the exercise tolerance of these patients, at least as assessed by VO2 max, if you don't want to argue about modified treadmill tests, regular treadmill tests, the VO2 max was very, very good in this patient group. And they had minimal ischemia based upon both due treadmill score as well as dobutamine stress echocardiography. To the investigator's credit, they've recently published this analysis, which looks at freedom from angina, so not having any symptoms when you ask the patients, how do you feel after a blinded trial? And it's pretty clear that there's a 50% of patients treated with PCI have no symptoms, and just over 30% of patients treated with the sham PCI have no symptoms, suggesting that the effect of sham is actually not that great, and there is a greater effect, significantly so, with PCI compared to medical therapy. Now, interestingly, this issue of a sham has come up a lot, and people have said, well, we really need to do sham trials. Once again, I will point out to you that the sham effect in this trial is minimal at best. So if one compares to prior studies, unblinded PCI, this endpoint, freedom from angina, both in the ACME trial and in the COURAGE trial, you basically see exactly the same outcomes with PCI and with sham, so 50% or so at six weeks versus 30% or so with medical therapy alone at around six weeks in both trials that are unblinded blinded as well. Finally, to speak a little bit about the patient's perspective, as Deepak mentioned, there's certain medications that are lifestyle modifi modifying, disease modifying, and those are obviously needed for all patients with stable ischemic heart disease. Unfortunately, antianginals are neither. They, don't, they actually worsen patients' lifestyles, and they are, don't really modify disease very much either. And so from many respects, even the orbit investigators say that this invasive medical therapy is not realistic in the real world, important implications for patient choice, but I think 
actually meant to say is intensive medical therapy. And then Professor Francis, once we open up the lesion and we normal clinical practice, take them off the antianginals and tell them to stay on the other disease-modifying medications. So in indeed a way, it's a choice. And I think if you were to interpret these data as showing there's no benefit of PCI, you're depriving patients of that choice. There are other ways to risk stratify patients. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into this in too great detail other than to say that even in trials like Courage, if you look at the patients treated with medical therapy who ultimately underwent PCI in the trial, it's the ones with the most severe symptoms. So if you have somebody with mild symptoms, they're fine on medical therapy and that's okay. But if you have more severe symptoms, these are the patients who almost 50% of the time had to cross over even in the context of a study and ultimately undergo PCI. Another way of risk stratifying these patients, as Deepak showed you, is by doing something like FFR up front. And the FAME2 investigators have presented us with data that show that if you treat patients in that way, not only can you have better quality of life, but you do better quality of life on less medications. So win-win for the patient who's symptomatic. In the last minute or so of the talk, I'll briefly talk about prognosis, because there is prevailing wisdom out there, and Deepak even said it, that there is no death or MI benefit based upon the COURAGE trial in revascularizing patients with stable ischemic heart disease. But the reality is that's limited to the patients that were treated in those trials. And there are patients with much more severe disease for whom revascularization is prognostically important. From the ACC guidelines themselves, one can see that as you get more and more severe anatomic substrates, such as the cases we see presented at this symposium, you start looking at survival rates at five years of 75 percent. If you're a 55-year-old patient, do you want that type of survival or would you like to do better? And by the way, this assuming medical treatment only is not my addition. That's actually from the guideline slides themselves. There are data from COURAGE showing that if you get more ischemia reduction, that's associated with a reduction in death or myocardial infarction. And even data looking at meta-analyses that show that if one treats patients with stable ischemic heart disease with PCI, one can actually reduce myocardial infarction outside of the paraprocedural period. I don't have to recall the recent publication from the FAME2 investigators just in the New England Journal showing that there's a reduction in myocardial infarction at five years, even counting paraprocedural MI among patients that were eligible for follow-up. There may be some methodologic issues relating to who these patients were relative to the overall patient pool, but this is still important and suggests that we actually can impact prognosis potentially with revascularization. Now, there are some downsides, and I think Deepak mentioned some of them, cost and then potentially patient harm and risk. But remember, there's no evidence anywhere in randomized trial data of harm of appropriately performed PCI. Simply none. So this issue of causing MIs, causing strokes, causing deaths, while well, they are unfortunate events when they occur, in a randomized trial setting, we don't see an excess of those in the PCI arm. And for patients, if we're really worried about cost, are we prioritizing society over the individual? In my last slide here, which I'll just show you an anecdote, um, this is a gentleman who should be familiar to many of you, who underwent what was termed widely as an unnecessary procedure, interestingly, by one of the editorialists who wrote the editorial on the Orbita trial. And the reason was is because he was asymptomatic, he rides his bikes, and so why the heck did he ever need a PCI? And he was subsequently asked later about you know, what he thought about people who, by the way, hadn't seen him as a patient, hadn't examined him, hadn't looked at the studies, but were just commenting ad-libbing on his care. And I think he was known for one-liners, often to his own detriment, but the one-liner that he gave at a meeting live was basically, it wasn't their LAD. So the reality is you can comment all you want, but ultimately bring it back to the individual patients. And in that way, just like the cases you see being done today, I think you'll be able to show some sensible and beneficial effects of PCI. Thanks so much.